Hey guys, it's your favorite reliability and test guy here with another fun-filled, action-packed video on reliability tests and validation topics. We are just two days out from my textbook, Master in Vibration and Shock from Hidden Barnes & Noble. You can go ahead and pre-order it now in the link below, along with the handy companion guide of all the answer keys for the chapter reviews and the final exam at the end of the book, along with supplemental final exams. To celebrate, we are going to cover Mill Standard 810H Method 514.8 Section 2 Taylor and Vibration Tests. So let's go ahead and get started. In this video, we will cover an understanding of vibration testing, selecting the right test method, test environment fidelity, measured data considerations, default and enveloped data, environmental effects of vibration, test sequence importance, selecting the appropriate procedure, Procedure selection and considerations, determining test levels and conditions, multi axis testing considerations, and operational testing during vibration. To reiterate what we learned in the previous video, method 514.8 focuses on vibration testing, covering scenarios like manufacturing, transportation, maintenance, and operational use. Essentially, all equipment or material will experience vibration at some point. So verifying durability and function under these conditions is vital. In section two of method 514.8, we will be focusing on tailoring guidance, the instructions on how to select the right vibration test procedures and adapt them to your product's life cycle. Let's go ahead and break down the key highlights. When developing your test profile, first consider your life cycle, then select the relevant procedure. Refer to table 514.8-1 for more information and see annexes B through F for more details. Section 2.1 highlights how to select this method. Essentially, you select the test procedure that best reflects the environment that your product will face. In regards to lab tests versus real world stress, while lab tests are designed to simulate real world conditions, they cannot capture the full spectrum of stresses that a product may encounter in actual usage. Environmental factors such as temperature variations, humidity, and unexpected impacts may differ significantly between controlled lab environments and real-world scenarios. The interaction of different types of stress, for example vibration combined with thermal exposure, in the real world can lead to unique failures that are difficult to replicate in a lab setting. Some key considerations include dynamic stress combinations. In real-world environments, products often face multiple types of stress simultaneously, such as vibration, thermal cycling, and mechanical loads. Lab tests typically focus on individual stress factors, so it is crucial to combine various stressors to more closely simulate the actual conditions in your lab testing. There's aging effects. Over time, materials and components degrade due to factors like heat, moisture, and constant use. While lab tests can simulate short-term conditions, they may not accurately represent long-term wear and tear that occurs over months or years of real-world use. That's where accelerated testing can come into play or the patience of long-term reliability tests. Field environment complexities. In the field, the environment is rarely uniform. Products may face a variety of unpredictable factors such as sudden shocks, varying humidity levels, or extreme temperature fluctuations that are hard to replicate in a lab. Differences in installation, handling, and exposure to environmental contaminants can also affect performance in ways that lab tests may not fully predict. According to paragraph 2.1a, laboratory test methods have limitations. They can't precisely simulate every factor like how different stresses can stack together in the real world. This can include temperature, shock, humidity, and more, all happening simultaneously or in a specific sequence. Reduction in test environment fidelity may lead to an increased risk to material life and function in the fielded environment. In other words, if your test is unrealistic compared to field environments, you risk discovering failure modes once your system is deployed out in the field. The guidance recommends assessing your product where it is most vulnerable and possibly increasing your test margins to compensate for any deficiencies in your test setup. Let's look at conservatism with measured data. 
Section 2.1b reminds us that even if we have measured data from sensors in real-world conditions, there are always limitations. The number and placement of transducers, the linearity of data in extreme conditions, single axis versus multi-axis, and so on. To be safe, the standard recommends using margins in your tests. If you have enough field test data, you can use statistical methods as outlined in NXF. NXF can be leveraged to determine how much test margin you will need. Let's look at conservatism with default or enveloped data. In section 2.1c, it covers using default or enveloped vibration data. The standards annexes provided broad data that can be applied if you don't have your own measured values. But these default curves are conservative. That usually means you might not need additional margin on top. However, if your product behaves non-linearly, you should do a ramp up step for 10 minutes at a lower amplitude before applying the full level test. Should you detect any non-linear behavior, you'll need to notify the responsible authority and possibly revise the test approach. This ensures you're not damaging your equipment prematurely or missing critical failure points. Vibration testing doesn't just mean shaking. It can lead to dynamic deflections, structural failures, mechanical wear, and more. According to section 2.1.1, there are a number of failure modes that your system could experience. Of course, there may be other issues unique to your Lifecycle Environmental Profile, or LCEP. Keep that in mind when tailoring the procedures to ensure every vulnerability is addressed. Next, let's look at sequence. Section 2.1.2 stresses the sequence of events. In a real-world scenario, your product might endure high temperature, altitude, humidity, or even electromagnetic interference before or after vibrations. Conventional wisdom is to perform vibration before temperature testing. However, if it is suspected that the temperature cyclone might initiate cracks for materials used in your system, you might need to test temperature first, then vibrate, or vice versa. The order matters because environmentally induced damage can make your product more susceptible to subsequent stresses. In section 2.2, the document guides you on identifying the environments that your system may encounter. Table 514.8-1 matches a category of vibration exposure to a test procedure. You have Procedure 1, General Vibration. Procedure 2, Loose Cargo Transportation. Procedure 3, Large Assembly Transportation. And Procedure 4, Assembled Aircraft Store, Captive Carriage, and Free Flight. If your product is secured cargo, you'll typically choose Procedure 1. If it is loose cargo, that's procedure two. For large assemblies, go for procedure three. And procedure four is for aircraft stores and flights or missiles. Each covers different requirements and test configurations. Let's go ahead and look at procedure selection considerations. The standard allows you to omit or combine vibration profiles. If it makes sense, for instance, if your product's application environment is more severe than transportation, you might skip the transportation test or fold it into a single more intense test, but to do this with caution. Make sure to compare procedures for fatigue damage, bandwidth, and amplitude. Be careful if you compress the schedule too much, because pushing equipment to non-linear ranges can either mask a real failure mode or produce an artificial failure mode. Section 2.3 says you must choose your excitation form, levels, control strategies, and durations to replicate the life cycle. Whenever possible, base this on measured data. But if that is not feasible, you can use the standards annexes for guidance. Focus on the following. Steady state versus transient vibration. Test durations. Control strategies. And lab conditions such as temperature and humidity and so forth. Climatic factors such as extreme heat, cold, humidity can drastically affect vibration outcomes. So if your real environment includes these conditions, consider applying them during the test. Let's look at multiple exciter considerations. For very large items or more realistic scenarios, you might need multi-axis testing instead of single axis. 
Method 527.1 addresses multi-degree of freedom test setups. While more complex, it can give you a test environment that's closer to reality. When performing multi-axis tests, you may need to reduce amplitudes as multi-axis excitation is more severe than traditional tests. However, the document does advise caution here, and you will need to document any changes made very clearly and thoroughly. Finally, Section 2.4 advises that if there's a potential for your system to be exposed to vibration during operation, you should have the system operational and perform operational tests during the vibration tests. For operational testing, you'll want to look at operating the item during the test, identifying performance degradation, and documenting any found results. And that's it, folks. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching.